Hey guys, welcome to Loves of the Choice. This is Kyle Haney, and I am so glad to have y'all on the show today. Uh, Loves of the Choice is about loving Jesus over loving anything else. It's about choosing to love him instead of loving our desires. It's not about changing external things. It's not about behavior modification, but it is about loving Jesus because he is worthy of everything. We have a very special guest today on the show, and I am so glad that you guys are here to uh, join us. And um, you may recognize my guest if you've seen the documentary Pray Away on Netflix, which is about gay conversion therapy and about how it's dangerous to change uh, or try to change your sexual orientation. And uh, it's, it takes a very unbiblical worldview. But my guest today is no doubt on fire for Jesus and actually came out of the gay lifestyle and the trans lifestyle. He lived as a woman. And Jeffrey, I'm so happy to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming on. So why, uh, I guess the first question is, uh, why did you decide to go on Pray Away? Yes, so um, the director came to me about filming the Freedom March in that we had in Los Angeles. And I agreed to let her film. And then from there, she just kind of asked me, hey, we want to follow you speaking at churches and some of your life and what you do and to show kind of the current movement with the former LGBTQ um, movement. So in that, um, I agreed to be a part of Pray Away. I knew that it wasn't a Christian documentary, but I felt it was very strategic to get to a lot of people that maybe never would watch a Christian documentary and to let them know, you know, the other side, the other choice that they have. Right. That's awesome. And what other choice is that that they have? And uh, if you could expound on what you mean by the other choice that they have. So in the documentary, it's actually presented that you just need to live in the homosexual lifestyle, that if you're gay or trans or bisexual, that's just who you are to embrace it, affirm it and live it. And I am kind of the alternate view in the documentary that um, that you can leave the LGBTQ identity to follow Jesus and receive his identity and not identify with things that you feel sexually, but identify with Jesus. And so that's what the Freedom March is all about. And that's basically what happened in my own life. I left uh, after I left the LGBTQ identity after um, living in it around 17 years. Wow. Wow. Can you tell me about that experience? How did you end up leaving the gay lifestyle, the um, you know, the LGBT identity that you had. And tell me a little bit about that story. So from 12 years old to 29 years old, I really just began to embrace that identity. Um, I lived in it, like I said, for around 17 years, just identifying that I'm a homosexual male and there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, later on, I also embraced the identity of that I was transgender, that I was really a woman born in a man's body. And at 27 years old, I began to live as Scarlet. I began to dress as a woman. I began to see a psychologist and a psychiatrist who diagnosed me with gender dysphoria. And basically, I began to go, I was in graduate school at the time. I basically began to go to my classes as Scarlet. Um, I began to date men as Scarlet. Um, really began going in public. Um, opening up to friends and certain family members that I was going to transition into living as a woman. And that was really in the midst of my life as Scarlet, um, I became more suicidal and depressed. And in the midst of that was when I had an encounter with God that really led me away from that. Wow. it's really awesome. Uh, I know that a lot of people say that whenever they, they knew when they were a kid, that they were different and that they were, uh, they had different feelings. Some people even say that whenever they were like their, their first memories, they felt different, which um, we know that, you know, little kids don't have sexualized feelings, but a lot of times things can kind of be twisted in our mind. You know, memories are plastic, uh, but there's usually something that, you know, happens in our lives, some kind of event uh, that causes us to believe a lie of the enemy uh, about our identity what what was it in your life that caused you to realize or think that you realized that you were that you were gay or attracted to men? What happened in my life was basically um, I had a lot of confusion from an early age. When I was very young, I had an older male that exposed himself to me. Um, I also I was very confused on that that the dynamics of 
marriage, men and women, how they're supposed to treat each other. Um, my parents got divorced when I was very young. So there was multiple things that really just brought a confusion of gender identity and sexuality in my life at a very early age. Um, and so I, I think that was a key to opening a lot of the things that happened in my life and what I believed about myself. Um, also around the age, probably around early middle school, um, I was different from some of the other guys. And I remember things being said about me. Um, and so on top of that, I was hearing different things uh, about who I was. And the Bible is very clear that, that, the, that our words have the power of life and death. And so in that words being spoken over you, you can start to believe them and accept that that's who you are. Absolutely. Yeah. I, um, I, I think it's, I think it's interesting because I had a similar experience with just words being spoken over me. Also, uh, there was this, I mean, there were people in school who called me gay all the time. You know, I mean, I didn't play sports either. Uh, I, I say either you didn't say you didn't play sports, but I didn't play sports. Uh, I, I, the only sport I was in was gymnastics and band also, you know, but um, and I was the most flexible kid in gymnastics. So, you know, I got comments like, oh, you can do the splits. So you must not have any balls or anything like that. But, you know, telling me I was gay and all these things. And I remember this one moment on the bus uh, on my way home from school. There was this girl who I'd never seen. She was uh, this gothic chick. And she, you know, basically just told me that she could uh, see my future and that I would be coming out of the closet by junior year. And it sounded ridiculous, but in my spirit, I felt attacked. So yeah, like words definitely have spiritual power and, uh, Mm -hmm. life and death is in the power of the tongue. So I definitely relate to that. And, um, yeah. So, uh, as far as, okay. So you also said something that kind of was interesting to me and that was, uh, that it was some other man. It wasn't a father, your father or your mother that abused you or anything like that. And I find that so interesting because I relate to that. And I feel like a lot of people do too, but the narrative is that if you were abused by your parents as a kid, that, you know, that's a reason why you're gay. And it leads, I think, to confusion uh, for people that are experiencing those feelings that are very real, but their parents were awesome. Um, so can you speak on that? I mean, cause that's kind of one of the narrative points there. Yeah, I definitely think that there's many people that can grow up in homes with a mother and father that never divorced, never abused them, you know, in any way, um, didn't go through any other molestation or sexual abuse or physical abuse from other individuals in their life that still feel this drawing towards homosexuality. And I think that there is some things that evolve from it, from trauma and wounds that people have. I also believe in the spiritual side. I know it's spiritual and I know that if we actually read our Bibles and believed it, which most Christians today don't read their Bibles and believe what it's saying, it talks about spiritual things in the satanic and demonic realm that is trying to deceive people. Or this isn't, you know, life isn't just like a garden party. It's literally a spiritual war, the Bible says. And there are, it it shows your value too. It shows the value of these precious people, how valuable they are because the enemy is constantly trying to deceive them, destroy them, trick them, bring them away from God. Yet God is constantly fighting for them. So um, there's definitely a spiritual aspect that I think tries to latch on and attack people and to oppress people. I'm not saying that people that are just in the LGBTQ identity are all demon possessed. What I'm saying is I think that there are spirits that try to oppress them and try to force them um, into a different identity because the enemy knows in the end, he wants to separate you from God. Absolutely. Yeah. He's, he's sneaky the way he does it. He just sneaks in those little lies or lies to you about events that happen in your life. And it's a, it's a nefarious plot that he has and he hates us all wants to kill us. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. Spiritually or physically, whichever he can do um, yes. or both, you know, on the topic of gay conversion therapy, what are your opinions on it? I believe there are many things that were considered conversion therapy that are very harmful and dangerous to people. I think anytime you're trying to use whatever they would call conversion therapy to force someone who's not wanting anything in their life to change at all, I think that that is wrong. I think that if God gives us a free will, then people should allow other people to have free will. 
I do think that everyone should be able to hear all sides and then choose from that. And so in that there's conversion, uh, you know, in the early 1900s, they did all kinds of things. They used to give men pills to uh, basically let their genitals not work. Therefore, they wouldn't be having sex uh, with people they were attracted to. Um, they also used to give men and women uh, lobotomies and shock therapy, things in the brain they would try to do to change them from feeling homosexual feelings. And none of those things are right. If we would just read our Bible, it says it's a spiritual thing that needs to change. It's not your physical flesh. You're not going to make your flesh physically like change. You're not going to change how your brain is shooting right now and wired to, to program. But what you can do in your life is have the Holy Spirit transform your life. And that's where Jesus said, no one will come to the kingdom unless they're born again. And when you're mm -hmm. born again, spiritually, everything changes of how you view things, what you want to be a part of, what you do not want to be a part of. And those things um, just transform your life. That's the Holy Spirit bringing conviction and transforming your life. So I think conversion therapy is trying to do something physically, which God said would be transformed spiritually. Right. I absolutely 100% agree. And um, so with that definition of gay conversion therapy, um, what are your thoughts on what it is that, they, that this documentary has called gay, gay conversion therapy? Is that actually uh, gay conversion therapy or is it just simply people seeking freedom? I think that a lot of people in the documentary were seeking freedom. And I think that they encountered many different ways, many different counselors, many different types but I think the end goal for anyone wanting to see their life transformed and not to be a slave to sin or a slave to their fleshly, you know, desires have to go out and do everything that their flesh feels, even though they know God is, has spoken against some of these things that their flesh feels. I think that um, there's just many forms of what these people were doing, counseling different things. I think that at the end of the day, it's about, like I said, wanting spiritual transformation. And I, I can't personally, personally talk about any of these people in the film because I don't know their story. I don't know, you know, what they did, what they didn't do, all the counseling sessions they're in. I have no idea. None of us were there with them on their journey. But I do know that God has asked us to deny ourselves, to follow him, to pick up our cross. So that doesn't just end, you know, one day because you want it to, or because you feel like you just can't do that anymore. And I think that when you focus so much on the same sex attraction, it gets your focus on Jesus. And you're so focused on that, that anything that you get your focus off of Jesus and focus off that you'll move into your own strength instead of his grace to deny those things. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And it reminds me of the quote from Julie Rogers saying, that whenever she was at Living Hope Ministry, that the from I guess the age of 16 until uh when she was in college, she said that the whole focus of her life was centered around not being gay. Um, what are your thoughts on that kind of statement? I think it's so dangerous to center your whole life on not being gay. I think that the whole point of any Christian relationship with Jesus is that intimate knowing him that relationship with him like even if you struggle six months in a row hardcore with temptation focusing on jesus during that time mm. not that i don't i god's gonna punish me i can't do this i don't want to do this i want to be a good person like you just can't focus on that the bible says that we were given a ministry of reconciliation that literally god was not counting our trespasses against us for those who believed in christ jesus and so those that follow him believe in him have that relationship with him you have to keep the focus on, on him and on his grace. That is says that his grace allows you to deny ungodliness. So I think people can get out of grace and into striving. And that's when really bad things I think can happen. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think that it's one of these, uh, one of these things where, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, and maybe also the true, the same is true for, the person experiencing these ministries, because personally I can speak on living hope ministries. I've been there and I, I love the ministry. I love Ricky. I love Bruno and Bonnie uh, and everybody involved in the ministry. And it's, it's beautiful. And my experience there was not um, focused around not being gay. Um, well, let me back up. I went there uh, before I actually went into the gay lifestyle and 
my focus was kind of on not being gay, but it wasn't until I had a relationship with Jesus after having exited that lifestyle or that led me to exit that lifestyle that when I went back there, my perspective on what was happening at Living Hope, it was totally different. And they yeah. weren't ever about, you know, um, forcing me or forcing anybody to not feel the feelings they're having. They never promised that, you know, the feelings would go away either. They just simply said that the goal is righteousness and um, that whenever you're living a righteous lifestyle, everything else, not, not righteous lifestyle, even it's just a righteous submission to Christ. Um, everything else follows after that. And I found that to be so true in my life. Um, one thing yeah. that I noticed that she said was that they would force the boys to play football and they'd force the girls. This is the Exodus, I believe, force the girls to wear makeup um, or to do these like makeup makeover parties. And I could see how that kind of thing would be damaging if the person that was participating or felt like they were being forced to participate, if, if they, if their understanding, their perspective was that, well, I'm doing these things to mask my feelings rather than, you know, for me, I, because I didn't play sports, it would have been beneficial for me. Even now I'd, I know the rules of football, <laughs> kind of, uh, but I've never played. And it's something that in my life, I'm like, man, I wish that I knew how to play some sports. So, I mean, I think that it can be a really, it, that can be even a great experience. Um, I can see how there'd be emotions involved also when you get on the, on the football field and you don't know the rules, there could be some healing that happened there from maybe emotional scarring, whenever you felt like um, as a kid, you didn't fit in with the other guys because you never played. And I can see how it could, how it could be perceived either way. Um, but I think that the intentions are right, but um, that's just kind of my view on that whole thing there. I think that you yeah. know, behavior modification doesn't, doesn't save you. It doesn't sanctify you. It's only Jesus, but you know, there's also yeah. freedom from fears because uh, uh, it's caused anxiety in my life, you know, the whole sports topic, but you can overcome that. I think that was probably their goal. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think that, uh, I think that it's completely different than gay conversion therapy. Um, yeah. But I think that the world wants to attack something good yes. um, by conflating it with something from the past that was uh, atrocious, you know, right. uh, it's the aversion therapy stuff. It's, it's not even the same thing. Yeah. After you came out of the gay lifestyle and out of the trans lifestyle, you went into ministry and you started a uh, freedom March, correct? Yes. I went into full-time ministry. Um, I have two ministries for such a time is where I travel sharing my testimony. And then um, I speak in churches, youth events. I do street ministry and then freedom March international is something I started to give a place for former LGBTQ to show their testimonies. And we also march in downtown cities publicly proclaiming Jesus is Lord. And the Lord led on my heart, don't do another convention or church thing, do it outside. And so our first mm -hmm. freedom march was outside at Sylvan Theater in Washington, D.C. And we marched around the National Monument to the back of the White House. And we just shared the testimonies there at the theater. We had probably like 12 testimonies that day. And then we marched just publicly proclaiming Jesus. And the Lord gave me the scripture in Colossians where it says that the Lord made a public spectacle of the enemy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't behind closed doors. It was out in the airwaves. So the Lord just laid on my heart strongly to do it outside. And so that's um, what I do. Freedom March has been in L.A. and uh, D.C. and St. Paul and North Carolina, the Atlanta area. And um, we'll be in West Palm Beach, Florida in October. So it's just moving around. It's growing every year. Wow. That's so cool. That is so cool. I, I can't wait to be a part of this year's freedom March. Actually. I, I'd, I'd love to come join that. Um, yes. what do you feel? Why do you feel that whenever God told you to start this, why did he say, move it out of the walls, move it into the streets? I think that the Lord has done so much for hundreds of years within the church walls, but, um, I just think that he's doing something different. I think that he'll continue always to move within the church walls, but the Lord is just, I, I, I just knowing his character, he's, he's changing things. He's wanting to reach everyone. You know, he literally is waiting for all to come to repentance. The Bible says the Lord wants all to come to repentance and people nowadays aren't just as 
uh, prone to go and walk into a church just because they want to feel God. Some people just go outside of nature or, you know, some people just randomly hear about God on the streets through people that will step out in faith and do that with them and share words with them or share what God's laying on their heart for them. So I think that the Lord is working inside the church walls and outside the church walls because it's not the church walls that make us the church. The church is the body of Christ. The church can be eight people together reading a Bible in your part, local park. That's the church. It's, it's not a building. It never was. And in Acts, it says that God doesn't even uh, live in uh, buildings made with human hands. So the church is his body. It's the people. It's all of us that have accepted Jesus Christ. And so in that, I think that the Lord is wanting to get to people that won't come inside a church building. Wow. Yeah, it's so true. And it, it reminds me of the reason for why you said you do you end up doing the documentary in the first place, because there's you know, people won't step inside of a church and people won't watch a, a movie if it's called, you know, why I came to Jesus Christ and left homosexuality. <laughs> Uh, yeah, people will look at the title and skip over it uh, a lot of times, right. but, but it's a, it's a good way of, um, planting seeds and, uh, just going out and being the hands and feet of Jesus. I love it. It's so cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. the producer of the film, her name is Kristen Stalakis, right? Yes. Okay. So whenever Kristen Stalakis approached you to follow you on your freedom March journey, um, did she, do you feel that she portrayed the heart of what it is that you guys are doing at Freedom March correctly in Pray Away? I think that Kristen Salakis was a lot more fair than a lot of people would have been towards the Freedom March or towards me. Um, she didn't intentionally manipulate or change anything that I said in the film. I think she was very strategic about what she put in the film. I noticed they never put my story in the film. I think that my story and my personal encounter with God while I was living trans would have been very threatening to the objective of the film. Um, so I understand that they're not, we aren't, we aren't working for the same team. Right. <laughs> Just to say it that way. Exactly. <laughs> Let's be real. We're not working for the same team, but I do honor her integrity that she didn't manipulate anything yes. I said. And she didn't try to do a lot of crazy things people could do with uh, film footage. So I definitely uh, have respect for her in that. I wish her nothing but the best. I yeah. think she genuinely believe that, believes that she's doing the right thing. And I hope that she has an encounter, an encounter with Jesus where she will surrender her life and her feelings and her thoughts and her emotions to what God says is true and, and submit to his authority that he's God and that we're not as humans and that, right. He's created things with a purpose and he's created things that are right and are wrong. And so I just bless her. I have, you know, no hard feelings towards her. I, um, like I said, we're just on two different teams and, um, right. you know, I, I've never dishonored her. I was disrespectful to her. She never was towards me. So, um, right. yeah, I just, wow. yeah. That's so cool. I love that you even got to share just love Jesus with her, you know, and it's funny whenever I started watching the film, you're the first person in the film it's, it's in your car. Yeah. And I was watching it with my mother actually. And I, I didn't know who you are. And I said to my mom, is this person a shill? You know, like, who is this person? You know, like, why would they be a part of this documentary? But uh, as soon as I started hearing you share your testimony and started just, I, I felt the love of God just all through like that first part there, when you were at Publix, it was at Publix that you were at. Um, the grocery store. Yeah, I was uh, some grocery store. Yeah, my little right. town I live in. <laughs> right, and when you were there, just talking to people and praying with people outside of the strip mall, it, it was obvious to me that just like the love of God is all over your life. And uh, I had to have you on the show. I was like, wow. Actually, I messaged you before I even yeah. finished the documentary because I just love the heart behind what you're doing, and it's it's very brave. And I and I just feel like God has given you that boldness to step out and do that. I want to talk more about Scarlett, about that time in your life, whenever you were living as Scarlett, who was Scarlett? How did she come to yeah. Scarlett was a confused person. <laughs> <laughs> when I think back on my life as Scarlett, it was just so sad. It was filled with so much uh, suicidal thoughts, depression, mm -hmm. manipulation, just this heightened sexuality with everything. I mean, when I lived at Scarlett, I was the most promiscuous I ever was because I was trying to pull this love out of men and I was doing it in a sexual way. All I really ever wanted was to be loved. 
And that's why when I, when I left my life with Scarlett experiencing Jesus, that he would give me that love and it didn't have to be perverted or twisted or sexualized from my body. It was a pure, clean, holy love that I am, you know, part of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, a brother to Christ, you know, a son of God, like all those things, knowing him, it changed everything because in the world system, in the secular system, everything is just so different and you have to exchange things for things. And it's like, with God, he just wanted my love and for me to love him. And so, yeah, my years as Scarlet were um, quite different uh, and completely different from the person I am now, for sure. Amazing. I, I watched your 700 Club interview and you said that you had started watching Jensen's Franklin. And I, I remember thinking in that point, how does someone living in the trans lifestyle endure Jensen Franklin uh, <laughs> teachings, you know, uh, the, what was that like? Like when you would listen to him, what was it you would feel? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I had actually went to Jensen Franklin's church in person when I was younger. Uh, my dad had invited me and I went and it was just a different experience. I felt God at his church. And so years later, when I lived in Scarlet, I actually, um, knew it didn't feel like I was welcome or comfortable really to go to a church so I would listen to Jensen Franklin on television or online and just things that he was saying were stirring my spirit and sometimes I would just be crying and I'm like you know thinking like later like why am I crying that's just an emotional experience I don't even believe really I don't even know if I believe in God anymore I don't don't believe in really probably the things he was talking about but it was definitely just um the Lord was using it you know to soften yeah. my heart and it wasn't every day. It was, sometimes it probably was probably six months apart, but it was definitely seeds were sown by him in my life during those, wow. during that time. Wow. I don't even remember him ever really talking about homosexuality. It was just in general, God, the Holy right. Spirit, the Bible, whatever he was preaching that day, it was convicting me and it was planting seeds for sure. Wow. 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 That's so cool. Yeah. God definitely, he reaches us where we are. It reminds me of like, uh, that scripture that if I descend into the pits of hell, there you are with me because he, he wants us, he wants to know us because he loves, he wants us to know him rather. He knows us already. I love that. Yeah. What were your feelings? Uh, what was going through your mind the day whenever you finally decided to put Scarlet in the dumpster? Uh, just a grace came over me. I knew at that point, I was probably three months after I um really had my encounter with God and I just knew it was time. Like, I just felt like Scarlett just didn't work out in every way. And as you know, still after I, I went to a dumpster and threw away all my hair, my clothes, my makeup, my jewelry, my wigs, my shoes, everything. And after that, it was still a process with homosexuality because I thought homosexuality is just how I am. I cannot live as Scarlett and not be trans anymore, but I cannot, there's nothing else I can really do about this other part, you know? And so I just, that summer after I threw away my life with Scarlett, was really when the Lord humbled me. He he ripped evolution out of my mind, said he ripped, you know, that homosexuality was right and I should be proud and this is who I am and show me that he actually rejects the pro the proud and receives the humble. Mm -hmm. And show me that I had to humble myself before him, that this was not right according to his plan and his will. And so that right. was definitely a beginning of a long journey. Wow. So cool. Yeah. So what was the what was the reaction of the people around you whenever this happened? Did you lose friends and family? What was the general reaction? Oh, yeah. So I had a lot of family that I was close to as a homosexual male and a scarlet that accepted me as that. Within probably seven days, they were gone. Um, I had a lot of friends that accepted me as scarlet in the homosexual identity in my life. And it was about within a week or two, they were gone too. I would say I lost about 95% of my friends. Wow. Um, they were just gone. And so... Uh, yeah, I just, I just, it was such an amazing place. Like when I lost all my friends because I was, had just felt that born again experience. So I was just so filled with peace and joy and love and all those things that it, um, it just was so fulfilling to me. It fulfilled me. God was fulfilling me in every way. So I went about a year without friends really. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
but God, he's so faithful to restore that back. He's so faithful yes, to restore the friends Yes, I have more friends than I know what to do with now, and they're all Christian. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, he definitely puts the people in your life that, that are supposed to be there to help you just grow and disciple you, and uh, he's very faithful to walk you through that. He restores back the years the locust stole. You know, yeah. Uh, I can't remember yeah. the exact reference for that, but that's what I'm reminded of. And with Scarlet, the name, um, I, I love that that was the name that you chose. You know, I know I'm not saying I loved that part of like that time. You know, it was an, I know it was a very dark time, but I think it's so interesting and almost poetic that your name was Scarlet because of where it says in the Bible that though our sins were as Scarlet, He washes us white as snow. And I, it's just so amazing that you, you are definitely a new creation in Christ and um, yes. just the love that flows out of you is it's, it's brilliant. You know, just the light that comes out of you, just compassion exudes from you. And I love your spirit, man, uh, because it's, it's obviously the Holy spirit that lives inside of you. Yes. And uh, is there any message that you would like to convey today anything that you want to let the audience of this channel know anybody that watches it what would you have to say to them yeah so i would especially i'll address the lgbtq community first i just wish that you would know how valuable you are to god you're worth more than uh, rubies or diamonds or gold or anything of this earth you are worth the blood of jesus christ being spilled and shed for you in jerusalem and not only that but the sin of the world was placed on him. And God said, anyone who would believe in him, follow him, you know, repent of our sins, turn from it, that they'll be saved. And when you believe in Jesus, when you truly believe, not just say you believe, you actually believe what he said is true and you'll obey him. And so I just want to remind people in that community and even people that are not in the LGBTQ community, just how much he loves you. There's a grace for you. There's uh, mercy for you. And if you decide to follow Jesus, you don't have to be perfect. There, you could stumble and fall and mess up and he's going to help you. But he will draw you away from sin. He will give you a new strength, a new life and a grace, like I said earlier, to deny ungodliness. And most importantly, he'll save you um, from your sin because sin requires a punishment. Um, all people will not be saved. Jesus was very clear, spoke about it over probably, I think, 30 times in the Gospels. All people will not be saved. Some people will reject the Lord and choose to be separated from him. But it's not something that he wants, and it's not something that you have to do. And it's so simple to receive Jesus by faith and just believe in him. And when you believe in him, like I said, you'll obey him. You'll listen to him. And he's not setting out rules and regulations to be a burden to you. He's trying to help you. Hmm. So true. It's so true. He loves us so much, like. I, I told my, I've told my audience before there's God is speaking to you. You know, he speaks to us. We have to yes. listen for it. So, yeah, I mean, if we just, if you, if you look around in your life, no matter where you are in life, you know, if you're living in the LGBTQ community, God, his heart for is for you. His heart is for you. And if you listen and you just ask him, Lord, speak to me, I want to hear you. Yeah. He'll speak and you just have to listen and, what he says to you, obey it. You know, I mean, his, mm -hmm. his way, his ways of life are life. Any other way yeah. of life is death. And, uh, but he yeah. loves you. And no matter who you are, if you've been hurt by church, if you've been hurt by uh, conversion therapy, whether uh, it's the kind that was portrayed in pray away, or if it's actual conversion therapy, if you've been hurt on behalf of the leaders that hurt you, I'm sorry. Um, I, I know how that is. I know how it feels to be hurt in church, a place where you're supposed to be safe. And I just want you to know that God's heart is for you and that whenever men fail you, um, he would never will. And yeah. just want you to know that, you know, don't, don't mistake your experience that you had where you got hurt in church for what the love of Jesus is, because the love of Jesus, it's so much more. Than what, mm -hmm. than what you've ever experienced, but it's available and free for you today. Uh, yeah. You just have to give your life to him and cry out to Jesus. So, yeah. Jeffrey, thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure talking yeah. to you. Yeah, thank you so yeah. much. And uh, I hope that everyone can come out to West Palm Beach, Florida, October 22nd and 23rd. Everyone's welcome, whether you dealt with the 
uh, whole LGBTQ identity or not, we welcome everyone to come and listen to these testimonies. And we welcome the LGBTQ community to come also. That's right. All right, guys. Well, this has been great. And thank you guys for tuning in for this special episode of Love is a Choice. Uh, this has been Jeffrey McCall and Kyle Haney. And I hope I hope to have you on the show again sometime, Jeffrey. Uh, yes. You know, just, just to hang out and talk. And yeah, because this has been great. But uh, I love you guys. We love you guys. And uh, just know that love is a choice is about choosing to love Jesus and surrendering our lives to him over what we feel is happening inside of us because Jesus paid it all for us. And so we choose to love him over ourselves. It's not about choosing to love a different gender or be attracted to a different gender. It's about choosing to love Jesus because after we do that, everything else falls into place after that. So Thank you guys once again. Remember to like and subscribe. Sayonara, you guys.